All right, looks like we're live. Welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer. I'm with Artist Network. This is Drawing Together. I want to shout out to everybody. Cynthia, see, good to see you back here. Welcome, Ursula, JC, everybody, Cindy. Um, yeah, so many familiar names. I love it. I love seeing everybody. Um, this is what we're working on today. This is this drawing of this, this mockingbird, which I hope is a mockingbird. As far as I could tell, that's what this photo was uh, titled as. <laughs> but, you know, it seems like when I was doing some research, there's a, a lot of variety there, and I know very little about birds. But through the drawing process, hopefully we get to learn them a little bit better. So I love seeing where everybody is viewing from. So many familiar names, people from all over the world. So um, <clears throat> today we're working on this toned paper. So I have the Strathmore gray toned paper. Um, I want to show you the other materials I have. It's just some paper towel. Um, I'm going to be using these Derwent tinted charcoals today. Um, who is it that shouted out saying, uh, yeah, Mary, uh, Marty Lake uh, got your new tinted charcoal sets. And I've seen a few of you uh, pick some up. Um, so I just am working with white um, and then just some light charcoal and some dark charcoal. So this isn't really from the, the tinted charcoal set, um, but I believe that these are in there, at least the dark and the white are. So I'll be using um, just these straight charcoal pencils. I've got my two erasers. I've got a kneaded eraser. I'm going to use this, um, this retractable rubber eraser that I have carved into this chiseled end. And I, I just find that I've been using this a lot lately, and I really dig it. And then, of course, my trusty blending stump. Um, so kind of getting back to this reference photo or this the reference photo the uh, uh, the, the preparatory drawing that I had completed um, if you want to follow along you can find the reference image in the description below you'll find a link you can bring that up print it up if you'd like to um, I also love to see your drawings so when you're done share them with us at artistnetwork.com there's a link in the description to the specific show page where you can share it if you have any questions comments observations I love to hear and read what you are observing. So if something seems off or if you have a question about uh, anything that I've done, or if you have a suggestion on how I might be able to improve or do things better, do things differently, uh, I love to, to see that here. That's what drawing together is all about. It's about sharing ideas. And so if you're new and you see people making comments about my work, just know that I welcome it. It's all good. We are all friends here. So, um, I hope everybody is drawing along. So if you are uh, following along, shout out. If you like to just kind of watch and then kind of do this later, which I know a lot of you uh, prefer to do, um, that's all good as well. I'd love to hear how that's going for you. So um, got to get my head in the game here, figure out what I, what I want to start with. Um, this one is a little bit different because it's a vertical orientation. Um, and I have some of my paper kind of cropped off here. Uh, so I do need to make sure I fit things properly. Um, what I, I kind of chose to work on this toned paper just because of the, the subject with those, especially on the wings where you can see that strong contrast between black and white. Um, most of the, the rest of the image is in a, this kind of middle gray area. And I thought it might be um, kind of fun to kind of explore that process of building um, the, the lights and the darks from this middle gray. So it's really all additive. I don't have the ability to subtract a whole lot. Um, having said that, you know, if you're working on white paper, um, and or you know black paper whatever material you're working on this all this stuff should apply to that so um, Monica all right drawn along with us um, there's just a lot of comments coming in I just want to shout out to everybody then I'll get I want to get started so um, I had trouble in the preparatory drawing um, really working out the proportion so it hopefully will go a little bit more smoothly um, this time but it really just starts with a rough kind of sketch. Uh, and I do need to use the, the, the monitor. So what I'm looking at in front of me is what you're seeing. It's got the overhead projection here. I need to be relying on that in this initial layout a bit more than actually looking at this paper because I want to make sure it fits on the screen for you. I kind of made some kind of adjustments here. Um, so what I might actually do is kind of give myself an indicator here of where the, where the screen kind of picks up so I can kind of give myself some parameters here. So actually I'm working on a, a smaller portion of this paper in order for it to fit. So, um, and then from there I can adjust things. So I kind of, you could see that I had started to kind of rough in that board that it's sitting on. Um, 
but I had used the paper as a guide rather than the window in front of me. So now that I have a line established where the, the bottom of the paper and the top of the paper, I can build the bird within that. Um, I just want to start to kind of map things out, get information on the page. Um, that's really the critical thing. And I'm using the light charcoal. This, uh, as opposed to the vine charcoal, um, and I don't, when I, when I typically I work in charcoal, I'll, I'll start with a vine charcoal. And um, I wish I had a good reason for not using it this time. I, I just felt like using this. So <laughs> sometimes that's all there is to it when, when drawing is saying, I feel like working with this material today. Uh, so, uh, but this, this step here could be easily achieved um, using uh, vine charcoal as well. And so if you, if you are new to drawing um, and you have any qu kind of questions about what's happening in these early stages, let me know. I know a lot of you are kind of experienced artists um, and it may be making sense what I'm, what I'm doing right now, but um, you let me know <laughs> that I was a little too, a little too strong. Um, there's a lot of things that, that happen kind of, it, it, when, when you draw a lot, things become more automatic. Just like any task you perform, the more you do it, those, those neural pathways become more established and you find yourself getting through these tasks more quickly, more efficiently. And so that happens with drawing as well. Um, and so there may be things that, that are happening that I'm not really uh, conscious of be just because it's been, uh, it's been a practice that's been building my whole life. So um, if, feel free, again, to ask any, any question, no matter how basic. Um, let's see. Uh, is, there a, is there a portion of the page that is hardest for you? I'm right-handed and always struggle on drawing on the left side. Do you rotate? I'm curious your thoughts on this. That's a really good question. So in this case, I have the paper taped down. And that's really for the sake of the live stream so that things aren't moving around on the screen for you. Um, when I'm not live streaming, you know, when I did this preparatory sketch, I was able to rotate this around to get it under my hand properly. And we talked a bit about this in the last session too. Um, I think it can be a healthy challenge and a healthy exercise to, to fix the paper because it can force you into developing a new set of movements and in greater hand-eye coordination. Um, when, when we have the ability to rotate the paper, um, what that does is it allows us to use our strongest kind of control, our, our hand-eye coordination in the, the strongest way possible. Um, you know, so there are certain motions that we are just more accurate with. And so rotating the paper allows us to target that a bit more specifically. Um, and so it is helpful to try taping it down so that you can, it really forces you to move your, your hand in, in new ways. Um, but I don't always do that. that. It depends on really what my objective is for that experience. Um, so I, I don't know whether left or right is necessarily an issue for me. I do know though that if, if I work on an area down here, there's a good chance that this hand will kind of smudge it. Um, and I just, I prefer to kind of let that, just let that happen rather than try to protect it. Um, and I work that into my process, but that's really just something that I, um, that's just the approach that I take. Some, some people prefer to have a, like a, a mall stick or some sort of bridge to keep your hand elevated off the paper or a sheet of parchment paper that might protect the drawing. Um, there's no kind of right way or wrong way to do it, but I think whatever works for you. I just, I, I have a hard time being precious with my work. And so I think that's why I've kind of, just kind of accepted that it's gonna get messy at some point. So, um, but that's a great question. Um, let me see. So I'm kind of now, now that I have the rough bird established, and you can see that when I'm tackling the curves, what I try to do is visualize it as, se as a sequence of short straight marks rather than one kind of curve along that belly there. Um, or along the, you know, the left side of the, the wing. Um, this is a kind of a more of a linear approach. That's something we talk about in the series as well, is that you can approach objects in the rendering either as lines or as shapes. Um, and I've kind of chosen to start with a kind of a linear approach here. 
So one of the things I could see right away is that I kind of roughed in the beak here, and you can see how large that is relative to the body. Um, so if I look at the reference image and I draw a plumb line, so I drop a vertical line down from the, the end of the beak, I can see where it should be intersecting with, this, with the, uh, the wing here, and that it should be way over here. So what had happened in my initial um, visualization of this as I'm laying it out, I had drawn the head way too big. And that, that's very common um, to get these basic proportions off, and that's why you want to um, practice kind of getting these gestures in. And don't get too consumed with the with details early on. The more time you spend working out the basic proportions and the basic structure, the quicker you're going to find that you're going to get to those details. So you want to delay that gratification. If you're the type of artist that really responds to the details and that's what is exciting for you, um, the, the challenge in that or the potential um, downside to that approach is that um, you can be off with proportions. Right? Um, it's, it's because our brain shifts when we're focusing on, on detail, that's a different part of our mind than we're trying, when we're trying to take in the entire um, kind of the context, the, 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 the totality of the subject. Um, and so you want to sit, sit with that totality as long as possible, try to see it as one solid object. So one of the things that I'm doing right now is, is I'm uh, moving my eyes back and forth between the reference image over here in the page, and I also have the, the small scale reference image in front of me uh, that, I can, that I can use. Just moving quickly back and forth and moving from spot to spot. It's, it's like this, these short jabs into these specific areas. Um, to, to intentionally um, kind of inhibit that desire to get in there and get those details. Uh, letting your eyes lose focus is really helpful as well. That helps you to see the, the whole of the scene. Um, and so squinting your eyes, letting it, and I like to fluctuate between squinting and opening my eyes wide, kind of flooding them with light versus limiting light to see how the subject shifts. You, you perceive the subject in new ways that way. Um, welcome, Jerry's. Happy New Year to you. Oh, Cynthia is asking what a plumb line is. So um, a plumb line is, it's, a, it's, it's a related to comparative measuring. Um, you'll have plumb lines and you have horizontal guides. So what, um, and then you'll have comparative measuring, and they all involve the process of um, using your pencil as a guide on top of your reference. So whether you're working from life or whether you're working from a photograph, you can use this technique. And if you ever have the chance to work from life, that's going to give you the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity for growth. Um, but what you're doing in that process is that you close one eye so that you, you flatten your depth perception. You give yourself monocular vision. You use your pencil as a guide on top of your reference. Um, and what a plumb line is, is simply just a vertical line from whatever point you're targeting. So in that previous example, I was, um, I was looking at the, the tip of the beak here. If I drop a vertical line down, I can see where it intersects the different elements of the bird, where it cuts through the wing, where it cuts through the tail. Um, and I can compare that to the reference photo. And so in that way, what it does is it gives me all of these intersection points. Um, and I want to get them lined up in my drawing in the way that they're lined up in the reference photo. And so you can do that with plumb lines, which are vertical, as well as horizontal guides. So I can take a horizontal guide, for example, and I can find, I can target the, the bottom portion of the wing and see where it intersects that tail, see where it intersects the board. And so it's, you know, similar if you, if you've worked with a reference image and you've applied a grid to it, um, that can sometimes achieve the same result. Oftentimes, though, when we're transferring an image using a grid, you're focusing on one square at a time and then piecing them all together. Um, what these tools look at, it's about essentially creating a grid, but you're looking at specific elements on the subject and using that line to specifically identify where that line passes through because that the, becomes the common kind of anchor for all those elements that helps to unify everything. So hopefully that makes sense. If, if that doesn't, let me know. So, okay, so I'm, I'm just kind of digging back into taking another pass 
looking at the bird, the basic proportions, and continuing to make corrections. And again, I'm, I'm kind of sticking with this linear approach rather than shape. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, like right now I'm starting to fill in this area and it's taking on the, the, the form, it's a, it's a shape rather than a line, um, rather than the contour. And we sometimes interpret forms differently when they're shapes versus contour lines. And so I need to, I need to start giving some mass to the bird because then it'll help me to see if there's anything significant off in terms of those proportions. So this is less about getting the values accurate and more about just being able to perceive the bird as a, as a shape versus uh, contour lines. Um, and then you can use your eraser to continue to refine the edge by kind of cutting back in Still using the light charcoal at this stage. Uh, and I, one of the things I have to remind myself to do is keep rolling it in my fingers as I go so that I'm rounding out. I'm not developing these flat spots on the core of the, of the pencil. So, um, Aaron Bell, that was a fantastic definition of a plumb line. A line uh, as of cord that it, that has at one end a weight, such as a plumb bob, and is used to special uh, used especially to determine verticality. So yeah, in construction, you know, plumb lines are used to help align uh, elements vertically to make sure that you know things are properly aligned. And then in in drawing, you know, that that same kind of principle is applied. Um, but what we're looking at specifically is where does that line pass through? Um, where does it intersect? Those intersection points are really critical in terms of of creating your proportions because those are the, that's where things physically align, where they connect. And it's really easy to to isolate elements. So focus on the head, and then focus on the wing, or focus on the body. And if we don't have an understanding of how they interact, that's where the everything starts to fall apart. You can get everything correct and get all those details in there. But if the proportions between the various elements are off, then it won't read quite properly. And like I said, I think working from life it presents a greater challenge and a greater opportunity. Uh, so if you ever have that, that chance, the more you do that, the better. Um, having said that, of course, we're working from a photograph here and there's still lots that you can learn from that. So. Um, So now what I'm doing is angle sighting. So I'm aligning my pencil with the reference photo and then I, I can carry that across to and place it on top of the drawing. But then from my perspective, I gotta get that out of the way. All right. Um, and that is, that's what I, I use that a lot is that angle sighting. So trying to establish this general angle here, the general angle of this slope Compare that to the slope of the belly. Um, so I, you know, I can see the faint marks of where my eye, the eye was placed before, and I need to make some adjustments there. I think I need to move this over. And if I use the side of the pencil, it, it generally allows the material to float on the surface a little bit more, makes it easier to erase. But I'm using a really light touch with all of this because uh, it, you know, I know that these marks are all gonna be kind of adjusted and corrected at some point. And so this is, you know, it, you know everybody kind of has a different association, a different relationship with drawing. And this is something I'd love to hear your thoughts about what, what drawing kind of means to you. Um, you know, for me, drawing is, it's a means to better understand the subject. The, the drawing process um, is a process of discovery, not just kind of execution, right? You know, there's, um, and, but that's going to be different for everybody. Um, you know, so I, 
I like to, I like to discover things and allow the the end final result to be some sort of example of of a discovery of whether you know whether it's learning how the material works or how this bird looks, something about light and shadow or texture. Um, but for for some, it's it's a it's a means for creating a an image. It's a kind of a difficult thing to articulate, but I'm curious what your thoughts are, what the drawing process means to you. All right, so I can, now I can kind of, I can move to the feet. Yeah. Um, and as this form starts to emerge, it's starting to create these negative spaces, so I need to start looking at that. Start to look at that negative space and the shapes formed and the holes kind of between the, the legs, the feet, that perch. Aaron Georgie, art is dying, please save it. It's an interesting comment. I'm curious what you all think about that. I have to I have to think more deeply about that. But I will do my best. So, um, hello everybody, anybody who knew? Cynthia is saying thanks, kind of like a mental grid of vertical and horizontal lines, except in, I'm drawing thin lines. That's exactly it. It's, it's a lot, a lot of it, um, a lot of it ultimately is mental, right? You know, and, um, and there, there are some elements to drawing that, you know, may happen purely mentally, right? You know, so you, some people may be able to work out correct proportions in their head and then be able to execute. I have a hard time doing that, so I need to see it on the page and then move them around. Um, and it's the same with kind of the, the basic structure. You know, if, if, if somebody's observing kind of a general shape of this oval here of the, of the body of the bird, um, some of you might be able to hold that shape in your mind and be able to visualize that while you're drawing. Um, others, you may need to actually have it expressed on the page so you can see it and react to it. Um, so there are things like that or like plumb lines. Sometimes simply understanding what a plumb line is, you can project that onto your drawing without actually having to, to render it on the page. Um, and it, so that it, that's kind of an interesting um, thing to, d to discuss because, um, you know, sometimes there are things that, that happen that are kind of parts of the drawing process that happen that aren't visualized. So, um, all right, welcome everybody who's new. If you are new again, you can find the reference image in the description below, um, and you can follow along with. Um, at this point, what I need to do is I need to double check the, the, uh, the relationship and scale between the tail and the rest of the body. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some comparative measuring. So what I'm doing is I'm closing one eye again so it flattens out the depth perception, holding this pencil in front of the reference image, and I'm placing the, the end of the pencil with this point here where the tail meets the body, and I'm sliding my thumb down here to the point where it meets the tail. So I'm doing that on the reference image. And then I'm going to compare that to the body. And what I'm seeing is that this distance here from, from this intersection point where the tail starts to where it ends should be the same as from that point to the, the beak here. And so by doing that now, I realize that this tail is too short or that's too big. So I have, to, I have an option um, in front of me and I can make this part smaller and keep the tail the size it is or I can make the tail longer. It's easier to make the tail longer and I have the room down here. Uh, so I can take that dimension right there. And 
and I can then use that as an indicator as to where the bottom of the tail should go. And it's not a whole lot, it only dropped it down maybe a quarter inch, but given the entire proportion of the subject, it can make a, a big impact overall. Okay, I just wanna, I see some comments coming in. Um, uh, there's a question here, I used to draw to impress other people, I, uh, I think if I'm being honest, but now I'm drawing as an interesting hobby and in the uh, game to see how good I can get. That's a great, Nate, uh, a great comment there, that, uh, fun net. Um, I, and I think definitely the reasons we draw do change over time. Um, and then also if we can apply that to um, the drawings that we are attracted to. Because, but I think, I think there is something very valid in the, um, the acknowledgement that seeing something that is technically proficient and it's done really well can be really exciting. So, um, and that kind of ties in with the desire to impress other people. So I, I'd hate to discount that as something, um, but it definitely, for me, that was something that um, was part of my drawing experience when I was younger and it's, it's changed, um, but, um, there's a lot, there are a lot of different elements to drawing and to painting. Uh, technical proficiency is one, subject matter, um, you know, and just kind of the relationship between the viewer and the subject, you know, whether it's the concept, you know, is it, is it the mechanics, is it the, the fundamentals like design and composition, so many things that can be exciting, both to create and to observe. Um, all right, Zephy, trying out new pencils. All right, hope that goes well. Um, and serendipity, you're rehoning your drawing skills, so welcome here. Hopefully this helps. Uh, Brenda saying the eye seems to be lined up with the other side of the tail. Let's see. Yeah, I need to. I was as a, I was just kind of adjusting that. So I um, help me out if if it feels a little off. But if let me see how. I'm doing some angle sighting with the tail first. I think it's using the tail as a reference as you're describing, I think is a really good idea. So if I get this right, I can carry this angle up and use that to relate to the placement of the eye. And then, if, so if I do that, then the eye should be kind of off to the right just a little bit. And I think what feels off is I feel like this needs to, the bird needs to be angled a bit more, leaning into that perch just a bit more and that opens up a little bit more space for the eye to shift off to the right make it somewhere over here so as we go through we'll kind of continue to adjust and then i think what i need to do actually is i need to put a value wash back in here Just need to drop some value here so then I can do some negative drawing to lift out the, the feathers here on the tip because I had outlined it and it was messing with my understanding of its mass. Um, this is where I probably should just grab a stick of vine charcoal and actually, I'm going to use this paper towel here. This, um, this is really kind of lifting off of the paper, so it's, it's a very subtle application. And then, oh yeah, WH Drawing saying the beak might be a little bit big. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that now. I think that by erasing this, it's helped me to see that a little bit better because the line here was so big, it was throwing off then my understanding of the mass of the things around it. So that's a good observation. What I might do actually is kind of give myself just kind of an indicator of where that end should be. And I might come back to, to working on that. Um, yeah, working on that as I get into the details. This is, 
um, one of the things we talk a lot about in this series is the idea of the ugly duckling stage, right? And um, that's something that I definitely observe in my own work is that art, the you know, the drawing process is generally pretty messy because I'm still trying to figure things out in my mind. And then part of that figuring out, you got to kind of make a mess on the page. And then out of that mess, the, the, uh, the drawing emerges. Um, so there's generally a, this ugly duckling stage where you feel like everything's just going to fall apart. But if you stick with it, you can generally pull it together effectively. And one of the things I have to kind of remind myself as I start to build value in here now is that I'm using the light charcoal right now. When I switch to the dark, I can really get some of those rich darks. Um, so right now I'm, I'm trying to um, work, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take those darkest darks and they're gonna be kind of brought in, they're gonna merge with the mid values in there. And then I'm gonna add the darker darks even later to build a deeper value on top of that. Um, Son of this, do you have any family who draws? I'm curious if the love for art is something you had to cultivate alone. I yeah, there's there's nobody in my immediate family that um, is a visual artist. You know, my sister, if she's watching, she is a pianist, um, and so kind of art, artistic thinking kind of existed in the house. Um, but there, um, you know, we had family members. One of the one of my the, my biggest influences is a, an artist named James Perry Wilson who did the diorama backdrops for the, the Natural History Museum in New York. And we had some of his paintings hanging up. He was a, a family friend of my grandmother's when she was younger. And so we uh, she had acquired some of his paintings and those were big influences. And knowing that there was a, con a family connection really was was inspiring. Um, and then uh, I'm loosely related to um, John Singer Sargent, and so hearing that um, was was also inspiring. So even though um, I didn't have direct influences, there were certain things that in, that were inspiring that helped give me a little bit more confidence because it's a little scary sometimes entering into art. <laughs> so, um, but I think that's true with just about any career. There's a little bit of fear. Um, so. Um, and then Claude is, do you have a mood or atmosphere in mind from the start? Um, that's an interesting question. I, in, in this case, I don't, you know, the, the, the role that drawing together plays for me is it's really about just kind of honing my drawing skills. And I like to kind of select subjects that are interesting and appealing. Um, but the idea is that by building hand-eye coordination and improving my drawing skills, I can apply it to my landscape painting. So when I'm out in the, on location, and so that's where I spend a bit more time thinking about mood and atmosphere and, and light. Um, but I think a little less so in this. But sometimes I don't know. It's it. Sometimes that's what the subject is is kind of about is is mood. But I'm curious what what your relationship is with it. Um, That's a great comment there, fun that everybody gangsta till you drawing never leave the ugly duckling stage. Yeah, I agree. I, I love that. I had, a, I had a professor who would say you had a term, essentially you had to go into the mud and then you had to pull it back out. It's like get, making a mess is where you start to really see your own sensibilities kind of emerge. And, and I love that. I, I like the um, the mentality of almost feeling like I'm learning the materials for the first time, even though, you know, I've been drawing for 20 years. Um, there's something about in that discovery that's, that's enjoyable and kind of remembering back to when, you know, the first pick time picking up charcoal and trying to figure out how to make it work. All right. I think I need to switch to my blending stump. So you can see that it's starting to kind of refine a little bit more, um, uh, 
uh, there's a question about color. Now there's not going to be any color for this one. I have been working with some tinted charcoal. Oh yeah, this this the the iceberg is done with that tinted charcoal that um, kind of pushes the color temperature a little bit. Um, but no, no color for me. I'm still trying to work with colored pencil and understand it a bit better. I haven't had as much time to work on it as I'd like, but for those for those of you who work in colored pencil, I have a lot of respect for that material, that medium. Uh, so as I have this blending stump, I'm trying to treat it like any other drawing material. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the direction of the marks, uh, thinking about it as a, as a way to contribute to the form. It's not just about smoothing things out, but I'm trying to look at kind of the cross contour of the forms. Those are the, the lines, imagine if it's a three-dimensional object, if you were to draw lines around it, what path that line might take to help um, establish the, the form. Trying to think about texture, so you can see the, the feathers in here are really all you know, jacked up. Something's going on, it's all wet. Um, so I'm gonna, everything's kind of smoothed out. I'm gonna have to find a little bit more kind of texture in there. So right now I'm kind of thinking ahead to the challenge of this space. And in just like when, you know, earlier stages of the drawing, moving around, um, I, I prefer to make quick decisions and kind of dart and move around the whole drawing um, and not get too fixated in one spot. And I've done that just because I've had so many drawings just fall apart. You know, I'll oh, finish an area, I think it looks great. Move on to another area, I think that looks great. And then realize they don't look great together. <laughs> So I've done that so many times that I, I've tried to uh, fix that. Oh, Cynthia's asking if I ever knew or worked with Raul Middleman. I never worked with Raul, but when I was at Mike, uh, he was definitely a big name there, a fantastic painter. He was definitely one of the ones that we would hear about. Um, oh, I'm glad to hear those comments, Cynthia. It's good to have you back. Um, Oh, easy boy, but I'm horrible with alcohol markers. I tried drawing with alcohol markers for the first time not too long ago. That's a that's a great medium. It's a it's a tough one. Um, yeah. Oh, and then hi Rachel. Thanks for the comments. Yeah. If you uh, if you type them out in all caps, it uh, it's easier for me to see the questions. Um, all right. Let's see. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually use my eraser to do some negative drawing just to kind of clean up and sharpen up the edges as I feel them being more kind of, I feel like I've got the proportions aligned a little bit better. Um, so what I'm trying to do is pay attention to the edges. Uh, so if you follow along this, this edge of the bird, it's constantly changing. Um, there, you know, you have some of these feathers that are kind of sticking out somewhere. It's a harder, sharper edge. Um, so it, you want to just be careful not to create a, a hard, consistent edge around the entire bird here. And then I can refine this a little bit more. And then in like areas like this, I'm observing how the values start to blend in with the background. Um, there can sometimes be a desire to make everything kind of super sharp and in focus, but I found that uh, increasing your edge variation can really go a long way. So really paying attention to uh, changes along that edge that ultimately adds to the sense of realism. And then also looking for kind of compound curves. So as, as, with this tail is a good example. It's, it's generally straight, and if you get that right, that, the correct angle for the, the axis, that can go a long way. But then if you, if you start to really observe the, the specific qualities of that edge, um, you can start to see subtle concave and convex kind of interactions between those curves, uh, and that can really help to bring a, a drawing to life. You know, somebody like Degas was a master of that, observing those complex kind of compound angles. And then I can kind 
come back in here and start to refine this, uh, the beak here. So kind of switching back and forth between the negative space and the positive space there. I hope everybody had a good New Year's. We're 2021. Awesome. <laughs> good times. Um, I know for me, I just want to keep improving as an artist. So that's kind of part of my resolutions, and that's what this show helps me with. And you all being here. So this is the part, uh, I can't remember who asked the question earlier, but about rotating the paper. This is where I really want to kind of move the paper, and I can't. <laughs> so um, I'm kind of, I find myself kind of contorting my hand a bit and I can't quite get what I need, so I might have to take multiple stabs at this. And I also can tell that I'm starting to calibrate my values a little bit. So in my mind, I'm seeing the these light areas as white, but they're not. I'm gonna be able to come back in with the darker, I mean, with the lighter values later. Um, so kind of have to do some visualizations and know that, um, like this area, I'm going to be able to lighten up a bit more. And this tip has really become blunt. I may have to sharpen that up a little bit, but um, I'm going to see how far I can push it. It's kind of part of my challenge to see how far I can push that um, blunt edge. So I'm just switching to that negative space, darkening that background so I can increase the contrast here <clears throat> and create that light edge against that darker background. And so my general philosophy in drawing is, is to, ooh, that was weird, is to allow the image to emerge on the page. It's about, it's about pulling the image out. Um, and that's kind of what I'm demonstrating here. But I know, if, you know, some of you, you may, you may work differently with it, you know, maybe work with an outline and then fill it in. But that's just kind of the way I've developed working. All right. All right, how does that feel? That works out okay. Um, So want to check here, see if there's any questions. All right, you're 10. Easy boy, welcome. What is that white rectangle? Are you talking about this? This is a retractable rubber eraser here. And what I've done is I've taken a razor blade and I've, I've kind of cut the end to give myself a chiseled tip. And that gives me uh, access to kind of sharper edges when I, when I erase. Um, and, and then if you, if anybody does want to share your work, you can find in the, the description below the link to um, the page on Artist Network where you can share your work. That'll be the episode page for this. So, okay, so now I'm, I'm doing some kind of negative drawing here, thinking about the areas where I'll, I'll be applying some of that light, um, that white charcoal. Um, so I'm trying to treat this eraser as a drawing tool, as a mark making tool. Um, so if I, if I look at the, the way the feathers kind of flow and wrap around the bird, that'll help me to kind of indicate its form and volume. And it starts to kind of simulate that texture. So I'm just thinking about some of the lighter areas uh, on the, the feathers here. So again, using this kneaded eraser with this chisel tip that I you know, just kind of carved with, an, with a razor blade, um, it gives me those really sharp angles. I had a, this uh, mechanical eraser that worked awesome, but I broke it. I need to, I need to figure out how to fix it. So <laughs> I don't know what I did, um, but it doesn't work anymore. So I'm kind of bummed. Um, so I'm just looking at some of the highlights. And again, these are really kind of quick observations um, I don't want to. I don't want to linger too much because the more you really 
focus on something, the more it actually gets distorted in your mind. Um, I found that like taking quick observations and a lot of them gradually builds up your understanding of whatever you're observing and um, ultimately leads to a more accurate understanding versus simply staring at something and looking at it deeply. Um, So if I use this eraser lightly, it kind of acts like a blending tool. Um, if, I, if I bear down on it, it starts to lift off the material. So I'm going to lift this off in here where you get those really cool kind of this metallic blue, these black and white or black and blue kind of stripes there on the wing that are really cool. And then I want to erase out the area here where it's going to be light. And I'm going to overstate that actually. I've erased too much of it, and I'm going to come back in and kind of do some negative drawing here to reestablish that, that structure. And so in that section where I, rather than draw a line and then fill it in, I'm trying to visualize the path and then make that line as an accumulation of marks that really follow the direction of the grain of the feathers. And what I might do is actually kind of extend some of this, this toning of the page down a little bit more. So if I, if I darken the page down in here, it's going to increase the contrast against the light areas and it's going to make that light kind of pop a little bit more. So now it's still working with the, the medium uh, charcoal. I'm going to start to add some of the texture in here. I'm not going for my, my kind of the, 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 the full tonal range here. I'm still going to kind of build into that. So I'm saving my, my, the tonal, the darkest darks for, uh, for later and the lightest lights. Still working in this middle area. So I, I kind of want to see how far I can push this. So my goal is to create these really fine lines, but you can see what a blunt <laughs> instrument this charcoal has become. Um, so I'm going to see what happens. So my, if I if I use it properly, I can get some really great fine lines. And so I'm just using the side of the pencil, and I'm going to keep rotating it because it being relatively a, a cylindrical core, um, if I uh, if I keep rotating it, that point of contact is always going to be really just a fine thin point. So I'm just using this overhand grip. I'm going to see what I can do. And I, I don't know, it may, not, it may not work. I may have to go to the pencil sharpener in a bit, but it's kind of a fun challenge. Uh, oh, the question, am I coloring it in? I will not be coloring it in. This is just going to be a charcoal drawing. Um, and what I want to do is I need to figure out the right balance of marks here in the uh, in this area here kind of showcase the texture. But I want to make sure that I don't degrade the form. I want it to be a three-dimensional thing and I may have, I think I'm going to have to go back and forth. Um, you know, between working with the, the, the charcoal and then erasing and adding in darker darks. So what I'm trying to do is, again, make quick, decisive uh, kind of observations and then kind of strike on the page. So what I'm doing is that when I glance at the reference image, I know where I'm looking. You know, so if, if I'm working down this area, I'm going to look quickly at that area in the bird. And I'm my, the, what I'm looking for are the shapes, right, and the direction of things, and what type of movement I might need to make. And so it's all happening very quickly, um, but it's, um, it's about look, targeting that region, kind of looking at the shape, and then moving into the, uh, another region as I move up the bird, and then seeing how those shapes change. And then, then trusting that if I... If I just focus on shape, 
value and direction of marks, it'll all come together and start to read as a believable texture of these feathers here. Because if I start to try to really wrap my head around, you know, the overlapping shapes and the way you have some lighter feathers on top of darker feathers, and then you have reflections in the darks, things like that, if I, if I start to analyze it too much, um, then it, uh, it can get really overwhelming and you can achieve a lot um, just by maintaining a focus on shape, just getting the shapes right, so. It's this little kind of highlight here. I don't want to get with the eraser. So back and forth with the eraser and the charcoal. I need to refine this form here. This beak is still too, too big. see so I'm evaluating right now so looking at the image on the screen which is this is what you're seeing it's a small kind of rendering of it and so if you haven't been stepping back from your work I don't forget to do that that's a really helpful thing to, to change the context of your drawing so you see it differently so flip it upside down look at it from a distance hold it up in front of a mirror take a photo with your phone and kind of look at the thumbnail all of that is you're trying to change the relationship between you and the image uh, so that you see see it more with fresh eyes. So. All right, so that eye, I can start to lock that in now. Does that feel all right there? Erase out that highlight. All right, I think what I need to do, I feel like I'm at the point where I need to start adding the lights. So I'm gonna to switch to this. Um, uh, let's see, there's some questions here I wanna to get to. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of break. Um, Uh, yeah, and then there's some questions. I'll be coming back into this to add more detail to that a little bit later. Uh, and then there's a question about using a paper towel instead of a blending stump. Absolutely. Um, the, 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 one of the nice things about using a blending stump is that it is a little bit more precise. But the thing that I like most about it is that it picks up material. So then you can start to actually draw with it. You can create some really fun marks with it. Um, and that's something that's a little bit more challenging to achieve with paper towels. So um, I, that's, that's how I like to use it at least is, I, um, is as a, you know, it blends things, but it also creates some really nice marks that are difficult to achieve any other way. Um, uh, Yep, all the items are in the description. If you ever want to buy any materials, there's also a link there. If you go to the Drawing Together page, there's a link where you can buy any of the materials that I work with. Um, uh, welcome, anybody who's new. Yeah, I'm working on gray toned paper, so this is Strathmore paper. Um, and I enjoy it for these things where I can, I can build the highlights as well as the darker values, so. Um, so I'm switching to the light areas, and I'm gonna sneak up on it. What I wanna do is, I'm using just a light touch, targeting the areas of kind of where the, the lighter values are gonna be. So there's a light kind of striking the shoulder of the bird. Um, and as I, as I make the marks, I wanna be thinking about the green, the, the, the direction that the, these fine feathers are uh, following along. So I'm just using the side of the pencil and it's kind of like a, a scooping motion. Uh, so I'm kind of landing and then lifting off the page and then rotating as I go. So it's like I make a mark and then turn, make a mark and then turn. And I found that with the, 
with the the white charcoal, it tends to float on top of the black charcoal a little bit better that way versus using the tripod grip where you're using the tip of the pencil. And if I need to really lift off some lights, I'll press down harder. And again, if you're new, this is a great place for you to share your own process. So you do, if you do things differently, this isn't how to draw, this is how I draw. And that may be different than how you draw. So, and we're drawing together so that we can learn from each other. So this starts to build into some of the detail there. But I found that using an overhand grip like this, it tends to create marks that feel more naturally formed than when I switch to the tripod grip and I draw more distinct lines. Um, all right, it looks like we've got questions answered here, but if I missed anything, um, I apologize. And if you if there's a question you really want me to answer that I missed, um, please uh, write it out again so that I don't miss it. I'd hate for anybody to feel like I'm ignoring them, but it's hard to sometimes to keep up with the comments. So, um, so when I'm working with the, really with all the material, but particularly the white charcoal, the way it rolls in my fingers is, um, is something that I pay attention to. Um, I'm not sure if that's helpful. You know, if you if you're not if you're not as familiar working with it. But I, I what I like to do is I like to think about the marks and 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 ask myself, does it feel like a naturally formed mark, or does it feel kind of artificial? No, and it's, I don't know as if it's better or worse, but it's just I, that's just my kind of goal. Some uh, there's some really amazing drawings out there that have very kind of artificial kind of looking. They're kind of stylized forms. So um, that's just kind of my kind of perspective on it. Um, Angelina is asking, when do you stream? I stream every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. We've been meeting since last March when we started this thing up. I think I want to. I want to go for this. The white here. Um, and you can watch all the old episodes. I can't remember what we're on right now. Seventy four, seventy five, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, you can watch all of them on, if you go to the Artist Network page, the Drawing Together page, there's a link in the description. You can find them all there, or you can find them on the playlist here on the, on the Artist Network YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get notifications. And um, Tomorrow we have Johannes streaming live. He does our paint-alongs. So I'm just kind of moving through, and I'm really trying to pay attention to the pressure, um, and I can let the uh, the black and the white uh, charcoal blend together to some degree to create the uh, contrast and tone, so a warmth versus a cool tone. And I like there's this kind of lighter strip down the middle that actually will help to um, kind of convey the form, the volume of the, the bird. So I want to get that right. Let's see. And there's down in here. So when I did the preparatory sketch, I didn't quite put as much detail as in that as I would have liked to, but I was in a bit of a rush. 
and I felt like I got enough of the, the bird figured out. So I'm kind of excited to dig into some of the, uh, the details here. So what I want to do is evaluate these lights that I'm adding, because I don't want them to compete with one another. The brightest area is really right in here. Um, and then some of these others are, it gets a little bit brighter up in here. A little bit at the top of the head, I need to add a little bit more. And then right in here, I'm kind of losing the losing the form, the, the, the overall mass. So I'm trying to establish that, I'm trying to make the head feel more solid. Because I think what had happened is the texture of the feathers, it kind of just, there's just a lot of texture without any structure underneath. So I'm trying to see the larger shapes of light and dark to make sure I have those. Um, and those should be more dominant than the textural marks. Um, let's see, uh, there's a question here, do you know where you can find gray tone paper? So if you actually go to the Drawing Together page on Artist Network, I have the materials list there, and I think you can, you can just purchase it directly from there, it'll link you over to Blick, where you can purchase that, that paper. Um, but generally, you know, most art supply stores, I think Jerry's carries it as well. Um, they should have it. I really like the Strathmore. And there's a, a couple different versions. There's one that's a little bit warmer. This is the gray toned paper versus the tanned, tan toned paper. All right, I'm need to, let's see, can I keep moving? Yeah, we're about an hour in. So we're making good time on this one. So here, I'm just kind of letting the, the the charcoal float on the page. I want the texture of the paper to help me suggest the texture of the wood. And what do I want to do? What do I want to do? Okay, actually there's this kind of a little bit of light coming down on this leg. I haven't drawn this leg yet, but I'm going to get the highlight in there. And then the same with this one. This one hits the light a little bit more strongly, so a little stronger. Uh, BZ Boy looks like you got to get more tone, more of that tone paper, huh? Um, yeah, I, I go through it pretty quickly here with this show. I like to use it. Um, so one of the things that can be helpful. So I'm drawing like these, these feathers under here that are a bit more distinct. And my, I know that I want to try to hit them in one go. Uh, so I need to think through clearly bef before I make the mark, I'm going to try to visualize it, make sure I'm in the right spot, and then try to just strike with as few marks as possible. And then here, let's see. I'm just going to use the white to kind of blend a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of a, cause some highlights, some variation of structure in the, the tail. And I love to see how the, the feathers change throughout the bird. You know, the, so the, the, the feathers here on the tail are so different from the, uh, you know, the rest of the bird. I'm going to kind of get that, that detail in the wing a little bit later. So I think what I want to do now is switch back to this medium and I need to get this leg. I need to get that leg drawn. And so you saw that I you know, made this leg as a series of short vertical marks rather than draw the long marks. That's going to help make it feel more three-dimensional, more rounded. Because um, what can happen is if I run these lines parallel, running the same direction that, the, that the, the axis of that leg runs, it can sometimes flatten things out. 
and it becomes distracting. blend it a little bit with this. And I don't want to spend too much time on the feet because I actually want to create some contrast there with some areas that are a little less finished than others. But I need to add enough detail there that we accept it. It doesn't feel unfinished, but not so much that it becomes a distraction. And I love how this little claw kind of pokes around that, that corner there. And then I'll start to add a little bit more structure to this. So just a light line to indicate that, but I don't want that, I don't want that line to be too strong because then that could flatten things out. Just enough to visualize the path. down here. So just using some hatching there to, to drop that in. Uh, again, I, wanna, I want the viewer's mind to be able to accept it, but also move beyond it uh, and not get stuck. They cannot get, not get distracted by the perch. I want the focal point to be the bird. So still using this kind of chunky <laughs> blunt end of the medium or the light charcoal here. Again, you can get you can get by with a lot um, without having to sharpen it. All right, now what I want to do. Actually, I'm going to lighten up the, the background just a touch. So before I add any white charcoal to that background, I'm going to erase off uh, some of the charcoal there. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question about my Instagram page. If you go to in the description, you should find links there. Um, see love, love to see everybody follow me but um go to artist network is also on the drawing together page there um uh, it looks like there's a bunch of comments coming in i'm just checking to see if there's any questions uh, that i may have missed mighty geek studios a comic book artist welcome uh j.a uh, there's a question here. Can you talk more about how you think of using toned paper? I still find it hard to map, wrap my, my, map my mind around it. I find it, I almost ignore it until I get to the details. I, I, what you described is definitely something that happens to me because we constantly are calibrating our understanding of values to our surroundings. So what can happen on the toned paper is that um, we start to define the gray as the lightest light. So there is kind of a part of the process where you have to start to visualize and, and know that you can build the lights from there. And so I brought these in a little bit earlier. Sometimes I do the lights really at the end, build all the darks and then build the lights. Um, but I, I kind of dropped in the, most of the darks, but not my darkest darks. Then I went to the light and then I'm gonna bring in the darkest darks again. And then it can, you, can, you may have to adjust even farther. So it is kind of a tricky thing. Um, and it does, it, I think it ultimately just comes down to experience and practice. So the more you do it, the more you'll be able to anticipate what's going to happen later, and you, your brain doesn't calibrate to the the, the values on the page because it again we're gonna we're always looking for the lightest lights and the darkest darks, and our brain has a tendency to want to assign those values as white and black, even though they're not. And so then once you start to uh, provide a little bit more context to that by adding lighter lights and darker darks, uh, then your brain recalibrates and see things a little bit differently. So I don't know if that answered your question or, um, but. Those are just some of the things I, I think about when I'm working on toned paper. 
Uh, let me see. Now let's. I'm gonna bring out my look at my dark charcoal. I've been using this guy a lot. It's almost gone. Uh, I'm gonna come back in with the darkest darks now. Um, and what I want to be careful with is I don't want to create hard lines. So I'm like as on the cap here. It looks like there's some darker values right under under here. And again, this is gonna force us to kind of recalibrate our understanding of this. Um, And so it'll make the whole thing look a little different and it, I may end up having to change some other portions of the drawing. Like right under here, I can add a little bit more uh, detail to that, that bottom beak. I just want to be careful with the edges. Because if I, if I draw a hard line, it's going to flatten things out. I don't want to do that. So right in here, for example, I'm looking at allowing these, these marks to run kind of contrary to this curve this direction, but I want the marks to run in a different direction uh, wherever possible. So under here, the, the feathers start to kind of wrap underneath. You can see what a difference that makes, so it really it starts to make everything else feel washed out. And I've definitely done many drawings like that where I'll spend hours and hours working on this area and I love the subtlety in the dark areas. And then I add a darker dark and it makes everything else just get washed out and you can't see anything. And you gotta go back into all those areas again. Um, so um, part of that is just a matter of experience and knowing you know, that things will change, kind of anticipating change. So when I'm looking now, I'm still letting my eyes lose focus. Most of the time when I'm looking at the subject matter, my eyes are out of focus and then I just come into the sharp focus for little bits and pieces. Um, Cause I found that I, I just, I, I mentioned earlier, I get into more trouble when I kind of fixate on one area. Right in here, this is gonna be interesting. This, this uh, kind of the gap between the two, the tail feathers there. You know, and then sometimes I don't, I'd be curious to see if anybody else has this experience, but sometimes when I'm drawing, I'll, I'll just make a mark that I like, and it may not really describe the subject accurately, but it looks cool. Uh, and so that's kind of sometimes a, a thing that I'm confronted by. Um, This mark making in itself can be seductive. So with these tail feathers, they're really broken. So I'm being careful not to kind of outline the edge. I'm, I'm letting that edge be rough, thinking about the direction of the marks. I wanna check the, the comments here, see if there's any questions. Um, easy boys, when you draw for hours at a time, do your eyes start to look blurry? You know, I generally haven't had that problem because for most of the time, I'm letting my eyes lose focus and on purpose. I think the more you can relax your eyes, the better, and that helps to prevent eye fatigue. Um, and I, I feel like you actually observe the subject more effectively when you're not allowing things to become super sharp focused. Because, yeah, you don't want to give yourself eye strain, so just be careful with that. But like I said, generally, I don't do that. Um, I don't have that problem because 
Um, I'm always just relaxing my eyes. You know, it's probably 75 or 80% of the time is just with really relaxed eyes, um, relaxed focus. Um, all right, so what am I going to do here? I want to get into this area here, the <laughs> these little stripes. All right, so what I first want to do, I want to try to think through my process because I don't really know, but there are kind of distinct kind of bands, kind of diagonal bands this way, and then you've got the bands that run this way. So I'm looking at these bands this way first. All right, and then I think what I'll do is going to use this really essentially the thickness of the pencil to create these stripes and it's you know I I could kind of go in and really calculate each one but I I, I just don't want to <laughs> so, <laughs> I just want to suggest them and I don't know as if the viewer is really going to count and say hey there's you know we're missing a one of those black bands um, but I do want to make sure that it kind of captures the overall impression of those bands. Come back in here with the white and like up in here, it's stronger. Um, and I'm just trying to observe where the lights might be a little bit stronger than others. So I'm just using pressure. If I need it brighter, I can lay in it a little bit more. Like under here, it kind of falls into shadow, so I don't need there to be a lot of visibility in those lights, but up on the, the upper part of the, the wing here, it's catching the light more, so those, those brighter spots become more intense. So I'm kind of just giving myself an impression of those wings, those, the wing pattern there. more than anything. Now see how it reads. I think from a distance it works out all right. It looks like a bit of a mess when I'm up close, but what matters most is how it looks at a distance. So, so what I was just doing right in here is just kind of breaking up the edges a little bit, softening it using the, using the white uh, charcoal. You can see how it's picking up material. So when it, when you just kind of use the side of it lightly, it just kind of scrapes things and blends things a little bit. Um, I'm easy boy saying white charcoal really takes over my drawing. That's why I don't use it a lot. Yeah, it definitely can. Um, I can see how that would happen. So um, maybe just if you do want to give it another shot, um, you know, just use the weight of the pencil itself and see how far that gets you. Um, and then if you need to add more white, kind of build it up more gradually but it can be kind of seductive in a way um, because it creates some really interesting effects and so there could be a tendency to overdo it. I'm uh, just checking in. There's a question about what I'm using. If you, uh, the, all the materials are listed in the description below. Um, you can check that out. All right, what do I need to do? Um, I'm thinking about what I need to do, but in order to kind of move this thing along, I'm going to work over in this area that requires a little less thought. So I'm just gonna kind of work on this. And I'm observing some of the texture on the wood. So I'm just gonna use the side of the pencil kind of, to kind of suggest that. So just kind of loose organic marks, uh, kind of simulating the, the the shadow areas in that texture. Um, then we get a bit of a, a light side, that lower board, then it turns into shadow again. Um, and I'm, while I'm doing that, when I'm looking at the reference photo, I'm actually looking at the bird. So I don't really have to think about this as much. <laughs> this, is, this is just giving me something to, to do while I'm thinking about this part, because this part to me is still too flat. And I think there's an opportunity to kind of discover more about 
the volume of the bird there. And so I want to think about what I need to do. adding a little bit of detail to that, that upper portion of the perch. Um, still, I still don't have an, an answer for this area, so now I'm going to move into another area that requires a little less thinking. I'm going to lighten up this portion of the, the background. So I'm just using the side of the pencil. I don't want there to be strong directional marks, um, because if I run these marks this way, it's parallel with the bird, with the tail, it'll flatten things out. So if you, I, I'm just using kind of lighter circular marks. And if I start to observe kind of lines, um, then I want to switch to like this, the um, kind of this horizontal marks. I mean, that runs contrary to that vertical, the th vertical thrust of the, the tail. It's just hard to get my hand in there. So I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm trying, it's easier to do this, easier to go up and down. But I'm, I'm thinking about that it could be problematic if I, if I make those marks too distinct. So I just right now, I don't think that's a problem. So, so the direction of the marks in the background can really um, play a significant role in determining the space in your drawing. Uh, so in general, if you know, the background is, in, is far away, the tail is closer, I want them to read as two distinct um, uh, places in, in space to, to distinct depths from us. And one way to do that is to change the direction of the mark. So if this is running essentially vertically, then run horizontal marks in that background and then carry them through um, from side to side so that the, visually then the mind connects those two together and says these, these parts belong to one another and is different from the tail and it'll start to accept them as being as two different places in space. If these run vertically and, and they're parallel with a vertical um, tail, then the brain will say, well, that's, they must belong together because they're running in the same direction. Um, and that's where it starts to flatten things out. So um, some of the things that I think about when I'm working in there, and it's one of those things, sometimes we, we put so much emphasis on the bird. And like I said, we, we kind of leave some areas unfinished so that you know it controls the focus um, but sometimes a little thing like that just changing the direction of the marks in the background can have a significant impact on the, the way we interpret the space and what I'm what I'm observing is that the, the way the light is reflecting is showing up better on the screen than it is in front of me here I can barely see the light areas and so I need to be um, I need to be observing the um, observing the, the the screen in front of me as a better indicator of what's actually happening on the page. All right, and I like that that contrast. You know, where there we have the dark against the light, and then light against the dark at the top. So we have the light feathers against the darker background, darker feathers against the lighter background down here, and that helps to kind of break things up a bit, create a little bit more atmosphere. Our artistic is asking where I live. I'm in Colorado, beautiful Colorado. I'd uh, love to hear where you are all viewing from, people from all over the world. Um, James is asking what type of bird is this? I believe this is a mockingbird. Um, all right, so now what I'm doing is coming back in with the darkest dark and to hopefully kind of expand that tonal range just a little bit to bring this thing to life. But I want it to be relatively subtle. I want to sneak up on it um, because if I get too heavy with this, it'll, um, I think it'll ultimately kind of go, it'll, it's going to flatten things back out again. I want to create more volume. I want to make it feel like there's, this, this is a three-dimensional object. It's more cylindrical in this area than anything. Um, oh, 
Oh, is that a question about sharpening? Do I have an episode where I talk about that? You know, I, that is a question that I, I got a lot um, early on, and I can't remember which episode where I, I kind of showed it. But essentially, I just use a I just use a razor blade like this, and I'm just sharpening. I'm just kind of pushing in like this. So, um, and I prefer to do that because it exposes a bit more of the core of the pencil. Um, in particular, you know, oh, here's one that's sharpened with a with a sharpener. You know, it does a good job and it creates a, a nice point. Um, but I, I only have this much of the core that I can use when I work on the side versus, you know, this, when I use a razor blade, I can really control the angle and that gives me a much broader area to work with. And then when I do that, it, with when, when I'm working on the side like this, it's constantly refining that point. Um, now in that, <laughs> It didn't happen with this one. I really wore that thing down, so it's pretty blunt. Um, but I had started with one that was quite a bit longer, um, and, but I had used the, the tip of it a bit too much, and it wore it down. But in general, when I when I draw that way, it um, it allows me uh, an extended drawing time without having to go back to the sharpener, and it. But primarily, it um, it gives me a little bit more of the core of the pencil to use. Uh, so I think what I need to do is this, this is the area right in here that I need to, to, to round out a bit more. I need to, I need to bring that center forward and wrap the sides around. So, um, I'm going to do is look at the darks that are already established and then bring them up a little bit more, darken them just a, a touch more. I want to be thinking about the direction of the marks as I do it though. Um, and you can see that some of these, I'm just kind of essentially just tapping on the page. And when, when I'm using the side of the pencil, tapping on it essentially creates a line. So I, I don't have to actually kind of drag the pencil as much. Uh, right in here, right in here, there's a, a larger dark area. And I want to I want to deepen the dark in here a little bit more. <laughs> Artistic is saying, how are you able to make it from that distance? I literally stick my eyes to the paper. Uh, like I said, I, I I draw mostly my eyes are in, out. Of, it's very soft focus, so everything is blurred right now. Um, and, and I only sharpen my focus when I need to. And then, and that gives me what I, what I need. I, being up close doesn't really actually help me a whole lot. Um, I prefer to have my drawings work better at a distance than up close. And so what you want to do is if you haven't yet is set your drawing up at a distance and see how it works. Cause what can happen is, is and values are affected most by distance. And so things can work great. We can perceive subtle value differences. Um, to a greater degree when we're looking up close. Things have greater contrast when they're up close. And then as you step back, all of that gets washed out. You realize that those values are very close to, together. We're really good at seeing subtle value relationships. Um, and, uh, but the, that generally holds up. Um, uh, it, it doesn't hold up over distance as well. So look at it from a distance or take a photo of it and look at a small thumbnail, which is essentially equi the equivalent of that. Um, look at it with shock, uh, soft focus in your eyes. When you squint your eyes, what that does is it, it limits the amount of light going into your eyes and it prioritizes the rods versus the cones in your retina. And the rods are more sensitive to subtle shifts in um, light and they're generally aligned with interpreting values versus hue. And so um, that's one of the reasons why squinting can be more effective. And that's to, that's to my understanding as a as an artist, <laughs> not um, as a a doctor. So if there are any many medical professionals out there that um, that say that I'm wrong, please let me know and correct me. I'm fascinated by our visual system and and how we perceive things. And so that's just my understanding of it, so please correct me. Um, but that's the way I understand it. That's why squinting helps, is that it 
it prioritizes the, the rods, which are more sensitive to value relationships, and the cones. But we do have this kind of generally this idea that if we look harder and really focus harder, we're going to understand something better. Um, but in drawing, it's actually the opposite. Um, and one of the, the ways, one of the tests I like to give to students is when you look in the mirror and you just focus on your nose, it, it'll tend to grow or it'll shrink. It'll just kind of keep changing. It takes up a larger or smaller kind of portion of your brain and it can seem to change appearance right in front of you. So, um, but if you, if you squint, if you kind of allow to try to take in everything at once, then your brain kind of focuses on the relationship between things and you'll ultimately become more accurate uh, of an observer. So I think I'm, gosh, I'm pretty close to done. Has it only been an hour and a half? Some of these go a little bit longer, but I think I'm pretty close to done. If anybody sees anything that I need to work on some more, let me know. I, I'm leaving a little bit of that lighter tone in here for the reflection in the eye. I don't, I don't know. I guess the question now is if I need to lift it off with, or I'm gonna lift it off with the eraser and see if that's sufficient um, or if I need to come back in with the white and really pop that, that highlight off. I don't think I want to, because when I squint at the subject, that highlight in the eye almost disappears. So that suggests to me that there's a more narrow value range there. So that's one of the other things too, when you're squinting, pay attention to which forms merge together because that, that's an indicator that those values are more similar than they are different. Because when you focus on something um, intently, you're gonna see, the, you're gonna, it's gonna heighten the value contrast. It's gonna, it's gonna take two things that are subtly different and it's gonna make them feel like they're, they're very different. And so squinting is a way to help kind of check that um, so you just pay attention to what seems to blend together. And then that's an indication that in your drawing, you might need to make those more similar to one another. Um, Klaus Tejana, plus for the retina explanation. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, my eyesight, is, uh, somebody is t uh, posting here, my eyesight is really bad, so I have to go in closer. And I broke my glasses. Uh, so, you know, I can't really draw that far away or else it looks like a smudge. Oh, that's too bad. Um, yeah, I, I'm uh, grateful that, you know, I don't have uh, to worry about protecting glasses <laughs> as equipment. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, and I don't really know what it's like to, to have to, to worry about that. Um, What am I doing now? Let me think. So I'm just scanning, uh, looking for areas that need improvement. What I kind of like is that I can see a bit of a, a, a halo light underneath this, underneath this portion of the beak. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop that in and see what that does. Right now, I feel like the beak doesn't not quite have as much structure as I'd like it to. Uh, let me see what happens if I use the blending stump. So I need to play around with this. Sometimes I don't know what needs to happen, like how to, how to fix something. So like I can observe that, that you know, the beak needs more structure, but I don't know quite what, what I need to do to fix it. Um, so you just play around and it, sometimes it ruins a drawing. Sometimes it saves it. But I think you gotta always risk ruining a drawing because that's where the real learning happens. It can get really frustrating, of course, but <laughs> there are times when I really kick myself and I have to remind myself, no, that's, that was a learning opportunity. But, oof. Um, and at least that's what I tell myself to convince myself that when I've ruined a drawing that it's not not all that bad. Um, all right, I think, I think I'd like to 
you know, give a little bit more structure. Since we have, I, typically, you know, we run an hour and a half to two hours for these live streams. This one came together more quickly than some of the other ones. So, and I, I kind of regret in this preparatory one, you know, not quite having as much detail in it as I would have liked. You can see that I drew this one a little bit larger. Um, and so I had actually a greater opportunity for detail in this and I didn't take it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply that to this and see what happens. What I like about this kind of overhand grip is that it, it gives me a little bit more stability, I find, than um, with a tripod grip. And kind of my, my only option for stability is I, I can rest my arm on this, this here or essentially rest my palm on the paper. When I switch to the overhand grip, I can use my pinky as a stabilizer, and that is a much smaller point of contact. So I have uh, less of a risk of kind of smudging or ruining the drawing in other areas. So just something to kind of consider if you're... Um, if you're experimenting with different uh, kind of pencil grips. Artistic saying, I love the drawing, keep going. All right, I'll have a go. Uh, if, and please keep asking questions. Uh, Will LaRusso, I did not take the photo here. Um, it was on a site called Pixabay, um, which is a site where um, you can find kind of copyright free, royalty free images. Um, but many of the photos that I've taken for the series, I, I took myself. Um, uh, Cynthia. Oh, I see your comment. <laughs> it's, I guess it's in French. Um, uh, Silly is saying, I like how it looks like it was painted instead of drawn. That's interesting. I'd like to hear more about that observation. Uh, I mean, it is... It, would make sense. I, you know, I think I generally have, you know, what's called a painterly approach to drawing, um, because I, I spend more time painting than I do drawing. And, um, the way I was kind of trained at Maiko was really more of a painterly approach. Um, so I'd be curious to see what you're observing in there that gives you that, that gives you that because it would make sense. Um, Uh, I'm not seeing any. Uh, is there? It looks like there's some questions, comments about the bird. So I think it's a cool bird, and it was titled a mockingbird. So hopefully it is. <laughs> Like I said, I looked it up to kind of double check, and as best I could understand it was, there's a bunch of, there are different varieties. Um, they're kind of cool, cool birds. I think all birds are cool. Um, you know, and, and this is uh, one example where I think you know, working from a photograph is really, really helpful because, you know, I think working from life is, is ultimately going to teach you the most about drawing, most about painting. Um, but it can also be valuable working from a photograph. And in this way, you can really um, explore the form and, and the subject a little bit more effectively than, than working from life. But, you know, what, if I were to observe this bird in, um, in the real world, you know, I may only have, you know, a short time to be able to, to capture it, and I would be able to I would have to do is kind of shift my thinking to focus on the gesture and the way the bird moves more than it's kind of the details. And so you just kind of have to adjust your, your perspective a little bit when working with a subject like this from life. I think what I want to do actually, I want to um, work on this tail a little bit more. And bring the values down a little bit. I think I darkened it too much. And so there's some blending happening with the layer of light and the dark on top of the light. So I don't, I'm trying to just observe what's happening on it because I'm on the page. 
I don't, I don't really often, I don't really know what it's going to do. Uh, right in here, I feel like there's an opportunity for more structure. So looking at those dark areas and that negative space underneath that leg. So at this point now, I'm just kind of fussing. <laughs> and sometimes I quit at this stage just because I, I feel like I'm not really doing anything that expresses anything more about the bird. Um, just kind of polishing it up. Um, and sometimes that's, that's good. Sometimes it's, I just don't want to deal with it. Um, and I say, I'm just done drawing or I'm done painting. Um, Here. I feel like I feel like some texture right in here would be really nice. I need to play around with that. I don't really know what I'm going to do for this, so I'm just going to start moving the material around and see what it does. So I'm using the eraser more as a blending tool at this point. Um, and I bring in some kind of sharper light lines. And then maybe this medium charcoal again. See if I can add a little bit more structure and texture in this one area. Sometimes texture is really about the contrast. Um, you know, so if working on one area, actually kind of working on the area around the area where you want to create con uh, texture, um, like it's, it's kind of true with, with all aspects of drawing. It's about the relationships between things more than, um, you know, the, in, in any individual element. All right, but I think I'm, I'm much happier with that form, the structure there, than I was in the preparatory drawing. So that's a, that's a good sign. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just kind of scanning to see if there's any place that feels flat. Um, like this feels a little flat to me. Um, so I want to try to break that up just a little bit, see if that gives it a little bit more structure. I think that helped. So sometimes just a little bit, a little mark can go a long way. Um, uh, Cynthia saying, Scott, do you ever draw outdoors in winter in Colorado? Oh, I do. Yeah, I used to. I mean, I painted a lot outdoors and I f it really once you get down to the single digits things start to to get really uncomfortable and the materials do funky things so I, I, once it's I, I don't do a lot of it outdoors anymore but uh, when it's that cold but um, yeah for a long time I'd go out you know if it, if it, it was if it was above 10 degrees I'd be okay um, Garrett drawing went to Micah as well awesome class of 2000 I am um, glad to hear you got into drawing birds. Awesome. Let's see. Um, do I ever use frisket to protect the white areas? I don't. Uh, Claude is asking that question. Um, I don't really mask a whole lot. You know, having talked, actually, if you look back at this bridge drawing I did last week, I use just kind of strips of paper to mask off an area to achieve an edge. Um, and that's really the only uh, masking that I do. Um, but I don't know if I have a good reason for it. <laughs> so I just never done it. Um, so I should give it a shot. Um, I don't know if it works for you. I'd be curious to, to see, to hear how you, how you work with it. Um, I don't know how I could have said that in the best English. Let's see, I wish I could explain it due to not having the best English, but the white color has a little bit of gray in it, which makes it look like a paint color, and so are the other colors. Oh, silly, that's a great, um, that's a really good observation there. So that, um, and it's interesting that you observed it, so it makes it feel more painted. You're, what you're seeing are the subtle temperature shifts. 
between kind of the, the gray uh, quality of the paper is, has, is one temperature. When I mix the black and the white charcoal, it's a little different. And so um, that it starts to create the suggestion of a color, maybe that's what makes it feel like painted. Um, that's a, thank you for sharing that, it's really cool. Um, Artistic is asking, what if you use a black and white photo, will it be easier to draw the depths when you use a colorful photo? That's another good question we've, we've covered um, in some other episodes as well. I prefer to work from a colored photograph because Again, my, my goal here with the series is to improve my drawing skills so that I can apply it when I'm painting on location. Um, and you know, the best option for me would be to paint from life. It's really difficult to do that uh, and live stream. So the next best option would be a color photograph. So I'm confronted with, with a challenge of interpreting color as value. Um, and, and in particular, it's the bright colors. It's the highly saturated colors that are really challenging to interpret accurately as a value because they're often actually darker in value but that saturation kind of tricks the mind it, 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 it it's perceived as being lighter in value so and so that's why i prefer to work with a a colored photograph is because it helps me to develop that skill if if working from a, a black and white photograph it certainly would be easier to do that so um, if, if my objective was to create a, a really solid drawing, I would, um, and it's about if, say this was a commission or something, I would probably be working with a black and white um, photo and actually digitally manipulate it ahead of time and then draw it. But in this case, because I'm trying to develop that skill of interpreting color as value, that's why I work with color photographs. So, um, let's see, do you ever use, do you have, yeah, thank you. I've got a lot of good comments about uh, here. I'm missing a lot of this. I'm really kind of bummed because I, I like seeing all these chats, but I, I'm not able to keep up with everything. Um, uh, what uh, uh, Hazen is asking, what eraser am I using? This is a German kind of retractable eraser that I've I just taken a razor blade to, so I give myself a chiseled edge. And then it's kind of worn down already, so the next drawing I'll probably chop it off again. Um, and then WH drawing is how do I char sharpen the charcoal pencils to be so sharp? It's really just with a razor blade. Um, so as I, as I push that razor blade in, you know, I'm kind of just sharpening the material. And so I start off with that and it takes a little bit of time. It's kind of a, a nice meditative experience to kind of get my head in the game before I draw, but it kind of makes a mess on the drawing too. Um, and, uh, there's a question about what drawing pencils do I recommend? Um, I've been really enjoying, um, if you're working with graphite, I've been really enjoying these, these Derwent graphic pencils, and then their Onyx pencils, I think work great. Um, but I've really not, I've not had any trouble with any other brands. So whether you're working with Generals or you know, you know, a Prismacolor or something like that, you can get some really great stuff. Um, Stadler makes some really good drawing materials. So, um, but I, I prefer the Derwent, I really like them. Um, but I, like I said, I haven't had any trouble with others. Um, let's see. It's such an image. By the way, my eraser destroys my work. Please suggest. Deadly Place. Um, Deadly Place, I'm curious what, what issues you're having with the eraser. Um, is it ripping up the paper? Or is it just smudging or, or what? If you want to um, kind of describe what's happening. I'd be curious because sometimes it can, it, sometimes the eraser kind of ruins a drawing by simply not lifting off the material. Sometimes it's like just scraping the paper, um, or you know, it, it's kind of softens the edge too much or something. So I'd be curious of what that is. Um, greetings from the Netherlands. Welcome. How do you sharpen the charcoal pencils? Uh, Jay Sisteri is having problems getting dark enough. Any tips? Um, you know, so if, if you're working with graphite, graphite can be limited in terms of its value range. And so you might need to get like a, a carbon pencil um, or, you know, these, uh, where do I have it here? This Onyx, uh, this is Derwent that makes it. That gets really dark. It's equivalent to about a 9B pencil, I believe, uh, graphite. That can get really dark. Um, if, if you really want to push the darks, I think charcoal might be the way to go. Um, but if within that it's not getting dark enough, then it's probably the paper. 
um, and not holding enough material. So you might need something with a bit more tooth. This is a, uh, this tone paper is really kind of an, an all purpose paper. So it works with charcoal and it works with graphite, but it's not great for charcoal. Like it's, it's smoother. So it's not really holding a lot of material. Um, and so if I really wanted to push the value range farther, I might have to switch to a different um, material here. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, uh, Veronica, what's the best paper to draw on? I, gosh, I don't know. Um, it's really worth experimenting with it. Um, I really like like an, a rag paper um, to draw a lot with, but it depends on the application. I like that for charcoal um, and anything that's designed specifically for charcoal. There are some rag papers though that hold the material too much and it's harder to erase. Um, like I can, uh, uh, Arrives BFK is a great paper, I think. Um, but then I've been using Hanamula paper for a while. Strathmore makes great paper. Canson makes a really good paper. I don't use fixative, so Klaus Tahan is asking that. Um, but I don't really have a reason why not. It can it can mess with the um, the contrast, so you want to test out your spray fixative. Um, uh, and but I don't fix it because I don't really do anything with these. These are <laughs> like these are just piling up. Um, these are exercises for me. But if I were to preserve it, I would take a sheet of glassine um, and protect it that way, and then frame it. Um, put it behind glass, but I, I try not to spray fix as much. Um, and if you do, I just try to use a, like a light workable fixative. Uh, I don't know, what, at WH Drawings, what razor blade do I recommend? I don't, gosh, I don't know. I just grab whatever's at the hardware store. Um, and it just it's helpful to change it out frequently because it does dull, especially with the charcoal. It can dull it pretty quickly. Um, and it, the, the sharper, the better. All right, thanks for the comments, Greg. What's coming up next? For next week, I'm drawing a sheep in graphite. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's challenging. That's going to be all about texture on that one. So um, the Mono Zero Eraser, Bev is mentioning, and uh, Greg, I believe you mentioned that too. I need to grab, grab one of those. I saw one and I didn't pick it up. Uh, one of those Mono Zero Erasers. I got to check that out. Um, uh, let's see. What's the paper... I'll show you the paper I'm working on right now. This is the Strathmore toned gray paper. Um, yeah, 80 pound. I, I prefer heavier weight paper as much as possible, um, but that's just, that's just me. Um, there's this, I've been working on this a lot for charcoal and I love it, the Hanamula um, bamboo paper. It works, I love it. <laughs> It's really cool. Um, I was really, I had never worked on it before, uh, before this, and I've gone through that really quickly. Um, I just think, I think it's really worth experimenting with papers and different combinations to see what works because it, it may work great for me, but not for somebody else, just based on how we manipulate the material and the process that we use. So um, it, I think it is worth it to, to play around with it. Um, let's see. Uh, Jay Sisteri, let's see, no charcoal. Um, yeah, I, uh, Greg is asking about the Onyx. Does it blend well with regular graphite? It does, I think so. Um, but it, like, as with every graphite, um, uh, you know, as you as I kind of talked about in this series, I prefer to you go straight to the darker graphites rather than build things up um, using kind of lighter and then gradually build into the darks. Because as you start to build up layer of graphite, it's it's harder to to layer on more on top, especially with the darks. So if I have a layer of graphite and then I try to layer on top of it with darker, it can sometimes be harder because I've lost the tooth of the paper. Um, so I I often prefer to use a softer graphite and then control the value just by using pressure rather than use the graduated um, uh, tones in a, in a graphite set. Having said that, for the sheep drawing, I'm going to use a range of them. So <laughs> it's kind of all over the place. I'm not very consistent. Um, uh, but uh, Jason Sterry, if you're having trouble getting the darkest darks, yeah, it, it, looks like you, it looks like you nailed it. You filled in the tooth. So the what's happened is that you if you if you build up too much graphite, layering in darker and darker, it's just slipping off the page. So you might have to erase that area down and then layer it back on top. And so that's the only way I've ever been able to reclaim that. So if this area here, for example, I wasn't get, getting dark enough, um, I would have to I would erase it down to the the bare paper again and then build the dark back in on top. So. 
and then uh, Garrett, Garrett drawing used some Mars Lumograph black pencils. They're carbon based and create a great black that's not, not charcoal. Um, yeah, that's a really good suggestion. I've been, I've been using some carbon pencils as well, and I really like them. They're, it's nice, nice rich black. Um, uh, and then Will LaRusso, uh, next week I will be drawing at 3 p.m. Eastern. So I, I meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern for drawing together. Check out all the past episodes if you want. If you've been drawing along, uh, I'd love to see your work. There's a link in the description where you can share it. Um, and I, I chose graphite for next week. And I don't really know why, because I could have done it in charcoal, but I just felt like drawing with graphite because I did this one in charcoal. Um, but all of, the, all of the drawings, you can really can use whatever material works best for you. Um, uh, and then Klaus Hanna is saying, most of the times the white chalk dulls because of the fixative. So I wondered, yeah, I, I, it's been so long since I've used a spray fixative. I don't really know. Um, but how, talking with pastel artists, um, I know choosing a, a fixative um, is, is kind of an important one. And I can't remember which brand is better than another, but they do affect the contrast. Some of them boost the contrast too much um, and others kind of flatten it out. Um, and then some might tint things a little bit differently. Um, uh, WH Drawing, I recently got a new set of graphite pencils, the Faber-Castell Pit, um, definitely recommend them. That, I, that, yeah, Faber-Castell makes some really good materials as well. So thanks for sharing that. Um, and um, let's see. Oh, Cynthia is asking what happened to the Monday, Wednesday, like we had last March. You know, when we started the series, it was three days a week. And that was a lot. And then we dropped down to two days. And then you know, a while back, it's been once a week. Because it's it's a lot to keep up. And, and here at Artist Network, I've got another job. You know, I produce the videos. So I need to I need to be doing other things. But this is so much fun for me. Um, so yeah, we are down to once a week. Um, uh, Artistic is saying many artists say the horse is one of the hardest animals to draw. What do you say? You know, I, that's a really good question. And I, I'd be curious to see how you all feel about it because um, the way I approach drawing is that it's about a set of decisions you make. And those decisions can be applied to any subject. And there are some subjects that are more complex and more complex than others. So like drawing a horse and drawing an egg maybe two different things, but you're essentially making the same decisions. Um, just a, on a more complex subject, you, you have to make that decision more, those decisions more. Um, but those decisions are about proportion, they're about line, they're about shape, value, texture, all of those things that we covered here. Um, but I, I try not to think of the subject as being any different. You know, I, I like to tell my students, like if you can draw a box or you can draw an egg, you can draw anything. Because you're just taking those same decisions and you're just um, you're just applying them to different subjects. And but some of them it can get more intimidating because there's there's more to it. But if you if you stay calm and focused and you and you just keep thinking about those same decisions over and over again, you'll get through it. Um, so it that's that's just kind of my 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 thought about it. Um, because otherwise, if I think about one subject being harder than another. When I'm confronted by the harder subject, it um, it just doesn't feel as good. <laughs> like, like I want it to be easier, and I like and I kind of like to lower the intimidation factor as much as possible. So that's the way I kind of think about it. Um, but having said that, there are some things, there are some subjects that have just kicked my butt. So I, I get it. Um, but it's never uh, clear to me what is going to be more challenging than another. Um, and I'm trying to think, there was one recently where I tried it several times before going live and it was really a struggle to get it to work. And I can't, I don't know what it was, but it just, I wasn't able to work through the process, process effectively the first time. And then some drawings just come together very quickly. Um, and, and sometimes it's a very complex subject that actually comes together quickly. So, um, and, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, you know some of these comments here. I'm glad to hear that it's helped some of you. Um, oh, Ann Bauer, uh, you're asking, have you ever made your own vine charcoal? No, but I really want to. <laughs> I'm glad you reminded me of that. I looked that up not too long ago, and it looks like it's actually possible. Like it's not not too challenging to do it. But if if you've done it, I'd love to hear how it went for you. Um, that sounds like a lot of fun. 
Uh, I think about that here in Colorado, we've had all the fires last summer and they're pretty frequent. Um, and it, so when you go hiking up in the woods, it's really common to come across a burnt tree and they just want to pick up a, a stick of wood and start drawing with it. Um, it's a little bit different. It's a different, different process. When you're, the drawing charcoal is, is um, uh, made in a kiln in a, in a specific way in order to make it functional. Um, and then WA Strong, do I ever work with colored pencils? I, I'm working on it slowly, trying to get better at colored pencils, but they're really hard. It's such a different process than working this way. I'm so used to kind of a painterly approach, which is additive and subtractive, um, that switching to colored pencils, which is very additive, um, you really are, you're starting with white and you're building up the color. Working backwards is very challenging. Um, and there's a translucency in colored pencil that is really hard to deal with. And so color mixing, it just, it, it's so different from how I work with paint that I'm struggling with that part. So that's where I, when I look at some of these great color pencil artists, I have a lot of respect because it's, it is quite challenging. Um, and it's just, it's a different way of thinking about layering the materials and color and color mixing that, um, I need to sit with it a little bit more. Um, All right, um, Mad Moments Go, good to see you back here. I don't know if I missed any of your comments before, JC. Um, thanks for all the comments. I think I'm gonna call it, it's been two hours. A lot of comments, a lot of discussion this week. I loved it, thank you so much. Um, thanks for joining me here. I feel you know pretty happy with this. Um, I think it turned out all right, but mostly it was a lot of fun to draw with you all today. Uh, so join me again, 3 p.m. Eastern next week on Wednesday. Um, we'll draw a sheep. Um, I'm going to get hopefully get that posted later today so you'll see what the materials are and what it's going to look like um, and, ha and have the reference image uh, ahead of time. If you go to the Drawing Together page on Artist Network, you'll find all the materials there as well. You can actually purchase drawing materials. And as soon as I get that posted for next week, you'll find the reference image and you can actually get a jump start on that if you want. Um, uh, Anna's saying, all you need is, a, some, is some willow twigs, a small tin box, and a fireplace. Awesome, I gotta give that a shot. That's really inspiring, thank you. Um, and then Monica, I really like working with the colored pencils. Uh, glad, to, glad to hear that. I'd love to see some of your work. Some of you have been work, working in colored pencil and then sharing it um, on the Drawing Together pages. So if you are, I'd love to see your work there. Um, all right, let's see, you got a question. I do paint in oils. Uh, Jay Sisteri is asking, Jay Sisteri. Um, I typically paint in oils, but I've worked in pastel, watercolor sometimes, but um, uh, would you like Crafton or Art Craft part way between the paint and pencil? Oh, I've never worked with that. I don't know Graffiton, um or Art Graph. I don't really know what that is, but I'd be curious to check that out. Um, uh, artistic, glad, first time here, glad you enjoyed it. Subscribe, sign up, uh, we'll see more of these coming up. Um, all right, thank you everybody. I'm gonna sign off now. If, I'm gonna hang out for just for a few seconds, let it run a little long um, to see if I catch any other uh, questions, but I will see you all next week.